So not so long ago, uh, we decided to watch a, a movie here in the community, and um, someone said, what about Saving Private Ryan? I thought, actually, that used to be one of my favorite movies. I haven't seen it in maybe 20 years. I haven't seen it in ages. I don't know when it came out, 97 or 98. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic. It's a classic at this stage. So we put it on anyway. And if you don't know the story, um, four brothers from Iowa, from a farm in Iowa, they go off uh, to fight in the Second World War. Three of them are killed. This comes to the attention of the, the Secretary General back in the States that three brothers of four have been killed. So they say, look, this fourth one, we have to get him out of there because we don't want to have to send four telegrams to parents saying all of your, your, your children, all of your, your, your sons have just been killed in war. So they send in this team to try and rescue saving, to, to rescue Private Ryan. Okay, that's the general premise of the movie. And uh, so... As they're going along, they're, they're, they're asking them, this squad are asking themselves the question, is it worth it? Is it worth fighting so much and losing so many men to save one man? Because obviously, as they're, fight, as they're going along, they're going through occupied France, trying to find this guy. And uh, will, will he be worth it if, if he's even alive? So they eventually find him, and uh, they have to join forces with... Uh, an underarmed, way outnumbered ally force in a, in a French town, and one by one, in defending this town, uh, the squad that were sent to to, to save J James Ryan, Private Ryan, uh, they're, they're they're all killed. Okay, I've only started. Give me <laughs> give me at least six minutes. Um, so then, just uh, the the last scenes of the movie. Uh, Sergeant Miller, uh, he's shot, and he's shot to the chest, and he's, he's dying. And so he pulls uh, Private Ryan to him, okay? And he just says to him, as I think that they're amazing words, he just says to him, earn this. Earn this. You know, this whole squad has died because of you, to save your life, which we did. Uh, earn it earn it and then it cuts back to the present so that was, would have been in the 90s where he's at one of those kind of graves you know those uh, the United States said they have a couple of grave sites um, also in, in Europe uh, where they just have white crosses rows and rows of white crosses to mark all, all of the fallen in, in, in war and so it, you, have, you have Private Ryan now James Ryan standing at the, at the cross of, of Sergeant Miller saying you know was I a good man did I earn this? You know, because he's an old man now, you know, all old. Uh, and so he's standing, standing there, you know, yeah, did, did, I, did I earn it? Like, these men gave their lives to me, did I earn it? And I couldn't help but think when I saw it, like, just how uh, Christian an idea that is. Every time we see a cross, you know what I mean? And I, the Lord, we ask the Lord, Lord, how much do you love me? And he spreads out his hands and dies and says this much. Have I earned it? Like if, he's, if, he, if he has died for me, have, do I earn this on a daily basis? With the, the little portion of the world that's entrusted to me and the, the, the few people that are entrusted to me, do I earn this? Because, my God, I should be trying. I really should be trying to give everything I can, give everything I can to serve those that God has entrusted to me, to earn this freedom that God has bought for me on the altar of sacrifice, the price of his life. So like, we should never just take this for granted. And when I think of today, like Father's Day, you know, I was just thinking this morning, like, it's, it's always, it's always, I was talking to some friends of ours there recently, and we were just talking about fatherhood and motherhood. And I thought this is always a dangerous homily, because I think both terms come so loaded with, with, with preconceptions and misconceptions. So often when we think of fatherhood, we think of dominance. And we think of motherhood, we think of slavery. You know, so what's motherhood about? Oh, tied to the kitchen sink. What's fatherhood about? Uh, working hard, turning the soil, and then beer and football on the weekends. Oh, wasn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, and but it, so I think it's been a very, a very, very successful plan of the enemy to to destroy family by destroying fatherhood, or at least destroy family by attacking fatherhood and attacking motherhood. So that now women don't necessarily want to be moms or moms of a limited number 
because motherhood is, I mean, it's, 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 it's a good thing to a point, but don't let it get in the way of, of your, your career and your life and everything else. And fatherhood, fatherhood, well, fatherhood is all about dominance, so fatherhood isn't really necessary. Even if you see a lot of modern movies, and even kids' movies now, the father either never appears or is entirely absent. You've got your kind of Homer Simpson type fathers out there who are just completely inept and ridiculous. Uh, American Dad, all those kind of cartoon things. Uh, they never show fathers as, as men capable of sacrificing themselves for love of their family. So like, the, the, the original sense of fatherhood, okay? Firstly, all fatherhood comes from God. To God the Father is the source of fatherhood. So all fathers are called to father as God the Father does. And I will keep saying the word father because God is not an energy or a goodwill or some sort of a karma rubbish. God is father. God is father. And so when fathers participate in fatherhood in, in an authentic fashion, they're doing something divine. They're bringing this kind of spark of fatherhood d down to earth and making it tangible and visible and, and incarnate. Right? Our, our faith is a kind of a, it's, 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 it's a, a faith that we can touch and see. You know, the sacraments all have a oil or water or some sort of a tangible, visible sign to them. So fatherhood is supposed to be made visible in fathers. But fatherhood isn't just biological. That's why priests can legitimately call themselves fathers as well. But all fatherhood comes from God, so it's not a bad thing. Fatherhood is not about dominance, no more than God the Father is about dominance. Father is not all about, you know, working hard in order to just serve your hobbies on the weekend. Where did that idea come from? That's, that's not the fatherhood of God either. Fatherhood, authentic fatherhood, is about setting the pace of self-giving love in your family. You set the pace. You show the family, so your wife and kids, what it means to sacrifice yourself for love of them. You set the pace of self-giving love. They don't exist to serve you, and you do kind of exist to serve them. <laughs> Like you, you do. Like you're there to serve them. Okay? So, I, I guess, I wouldn't say that fatherhood was necessarily understood back in the day either. I'm not sure if we had it right in the 40s and 50s. I don't really think so. Um, talking to, to some friends again recently, they were saying like it, was, it would have been unimaginable in the 40s, 50s, 60s that a father would change a nappy. Now, my brother and brothers-in-law, well, most of them anyway, changed nappies, <laughs> which is good. I think it's a good thing. Because again, if, you're, if as a father, your job is to set the pace of self-giving love, then, what, then yeah, changing a nappy, that's, 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 that's love right there. It's gross. <laughs> All right? I remember once I had to babysit my, uh, there were two, two nieces at the time, two nieces, I don't think my nephew had come along, uh, no, two nieces. And um, one of them came to me and said, pa pa Uncle Patrick, which is me, Uncle Patrick, uh, I made a doo-doo in her nappy. And I said, okay, congratulations. Well done. She said, that's not what mommy says. Uh, uh, mommy isn't here right now. I said, I said, no nappy. I said, uh, no, oh, no, no, you don't. I'm sure it's fine. Just enjoy it. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I said, no, I think, I think, I think, oh, I think, I need no nappy. And I, oh my goodness. Now, I can more or less strip down a car engine, right? Um, I was adjusting the suspension of my quad the other day. I mean, I can do lots of things, okay? But nappies on babies, uh, I, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm a spiritual father. Spiritual father. <laughs> so it works. So I, I half filled the bath with water, and I held her under the armpits, and I stirred her <laughs> around, gave her a little shake, and then said, S sit, <laughs> sit there. And I called my sister, Norma, Norma we have an emergency. <laughs> she said, what is it? Uh, Amy needs a nappy change. Uh, she half, she's half changed, she's okay. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, okay, modern day fathers, I think, understand, right? The, at least that aspect of things. But, and, but something we've lost along the way is that we as fathers are supposed to be an example and, and lead and lead, and that's, that's, again, that's, that's nothing to do with dominance. It's to do with, I, I'll put myself on the line for love of my family. It's an example I use a lot, but you can imagine, like, you know, the couple are in, are in bed at three o'clock in the morning, they hear some glass break downstairs. I mean, what self-respecting husband is going to say, honey, 
do you want to check that out? You know, I mean, we just kind of instinctively understand. You put yourself on the line for your family. Get up. Check it out, even if your wife is bigger than you. All right? Even if you're married to Katie Taylor, we had this discussion during the week, if you're, to, if you're married to Katie Taylor and someone broke into your house, who goes down to defend you? <laughs> I said, I, think, I still think it's the guy, but anyway, because I don't think they're going to have a, a, a fair boxing match down there like it's going to be. Anyway, let's not get lost in detail. Uh, so you put yourself on the line, and that's, 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 there's nothing wrong, that's not a, there's, there's nothing dominant about that. It's service. And in the same way, motherhood. Motherhood is, is, is service. So uh, as a mom, then you, you know, you, you do, you serve your kids. And you serve your husband. But n- none of this is, is slavery or none of this is inferiority. The husband serves and the mother serves. The wife serves. So fatherhood is about love, loving service and motherhood is about loving service. For, for both of us. Like it's not... It's not only one, it's not only, it's, it, it's both. And I think, I think there needs to be a, a rediscovery of that today because I think that we often have this kind of pendulum thing where maybe in the 50s and 60s, like mo- mothers carried families, eight, nine kids, a couple of miscarriages on the way that no one spoke about, uh, alcoholism in, in the family, working hard, you know, cot debts, and, and like, life was tough. So much immigration, like, you know, if you had an education at all, you left for America or England to just get out of the country and work somewhere else where there was actually money. Um, and so, like, it, life was hard. And this kind of hardness came into society, came into fatherhood as well. But there was very little, maybe, tenderness or understanding uh, in fathers. But now things have kind of swung the other way, where now so many men don't assume any responsibility in the family at all. You see 25, 26, 30-year-olds walking around in tracksuits looking at their phone all the time, looking at videos of cats on skateboards. and It's just, you know, grow up. Get a life. Start pulling yourself together and providing for a family. You know, so we've kind of swung too far the other direction. So that, that there is somewhere in the middle where fathers can set the pace of self-giving love and, and show their family what it, what it means to love, what it means to sacrifice themselves. So often, when we think of our various crosses, our, our difficulties, the things that, 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 that strike us hard, you know, the things that really knock us in our lives, the, the line from this gospel, I think, uh, it's, it's very, very real. What the apostles say to Jesus, so there's a storm, and Jesus is sleeping during the storm. And they say these, um, I say, very, very real words. Master, do you not care? Do you not care? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a raw thing to say, but I think very real. It's, it's, it's a very real thing to say. If, if, you're, if you've just been diagnosed with cancer after five years of remission and here you go all over again, chemo and fear and trying to kind of keep it to yourself for as long as you can and all of the, the, everything that goes with it, or you lose a child, or something, something tragic happens, you know, and just this, this, this line will, will, I think will resonate with so many of us, like, Lord, do you not care? Do you not care? In our first reading, it's from the book of Job, right? So Job starts, the whole book starts with Job being so blessed, right? He has many camels, he has a huge family, he has lots of property, and everything is going so well. And Satan speaks with God and says, the only reason Job is a good man, an honest man, is because you bless him with wealth and a big family and all of these things. Of course he's happy. T- take those from him, and he will curse the day of his birth. He will not be faithful anymore without those things. And so this is what, what happens then, uh, one chapter after the next, uh, he loses brigands, break in, steal his sheep, steal his camels. Uh, there's a, the, the house collapses and his family are killed. And he loses everything very, very quickly. And then he has this kind of skin disease. So he's just absolutely miserable. And this, this question rises right from the book. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Surely the bad things should be reserved for bad people. For those who, who, who hate God or those who are evil. Bad things should happen to them. Bad things shouldn't happen to good people. 
Again, it's a very normal kind of a question, a question that has been asked throughout history since the beginning of time. Okay, why do bad things happen to good people? So we have to give two answers. One, the answer from the book of Job, and then two, we'll kind of flesh out that, that answer a little. So the answer from the book of Job is, um, no offence to sacred scripture, but it's, it's a little unsatisfactory, uh, in that the Lord, God speaks to Job and lists a load of, uh, lists various uh, phenomenon and asks, do you know how they work? Right, so the seas. Who pent up the seas behind closed doors when it leapt tumultuous out of, it, out of the womb? When I wrapped it in a robe of mist and made clouds and, and, and made back black clouds its swaddling bands? When I marked the bounds for it not to cross so the sea would only go so far? And then he speaks about the soaring eagle who taught him to fly and the gazelle who taught him to jump and all these wonders of creation. You know, who measured the earth? Were you there? He asks, you know, so he asks all of these questions. And at the end, Job chooses silence. He says, I do not know, I will not say any more. So the answer in, in the book, again, it, it's not entirely complete. But what it's saying is, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. And, and this can be, this is true, but it's, it's not necessarily easy to understand. An example that often comes to my mind is that if, if you had a child and a, that child had came into you with a pain in its leg and then uh, you said, oh, it'll be fine, did you fall, did you get a knock or anything? No, you, you'll be grand, walk it off. And uh, two days time, three days time, it's, it's, just, it's just, he's starting to limp and bless, that doesn't look good actually. Okay, we bring him to the doctor, x-ray, and they discover there's uh, some sort of a tumor in the leg. And the doctor says, look, if I'm honest, this, this, this isn't good. Uh, it's quite an aggressive quite an aggressive cancer, uh, but we'll send it to the oncologist and, and we'll see what happens. Oncologist says, okay, this is, uh, this is dangerous. Uh, we're going to have to amputate. It's gone into the bone. Uh, so we've, we've no choice. Now you as a parent, you're faced with this, with this horrific decision and yet it's, it's as clear as day what you have to do. The leg needs to be amputated and they need you to sign off on it because your child is nine years of age. So you sign off. Now, could your nine-year-old look at you and say, why do you hate me so much that you would send me to these bad people to cut my leg off? And it's, it's going to be difficult to explain to a nine-year-old that, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing this because I hate you. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I'm allowing this because I love you. Because I love you, I'm allowing this amputation. Not because I don't like you, but because I want to save your life. So often when crosses come our way, they're not punishment for sin, but it's, it's we, we meditated it during the week as well, St. Paul who has this thorn in the flesh to stop him from getting proud. So often the crosses that come our way, they're not punishment from God, but it's to teach us to rely on him. This life is short, and even though there, may, there will be suffering in it, there will be crosses in it, they will pass, they will pass. 10,000 years is only the beginning of eternity. So there will be crosses here, and, and, and they're hard. And I'm not diminishing anybody's suffering at all. It's difficult, like if, if you have some sort of a slow degenerative disease, or if, if your marriage is difficult, and you, all you can see is 20, 30 years ahead of you of, of struggle. These things are not easy, absolutely not. But the big picture that the enemy does not want us to look at, the big picture is that we're called to heaven, to eternal life, eternal happiness, eternity with God. That's the, po that's the point, that's, the, that's what makes it all make sense. If something, even something sad like a cross, helps us get to heaven, then even though it, it's not necessarily God's will, as in it, 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 he allows it to happen, he doesn't want it, he doesn't want sin or the consequences of sin, if he allows these things and they help us get to heaven, then they have served God ultimately. As St. Paul says in Romans 8, God turns all things to the good for those who love him. Master, do you not care? And immediately Jesus acts. He stands up, rebukes the wind and the sea, and all is calm. 
So he doesn't answer the question, but he acts on it. And we pray that today we will see the Lord work powerfully in our lives too. We may not have mystical experiences where we hear the Lord speak to us, but when we authentically come to him in prayer and say, Lord, this situation in my life is a mess, or my employment situation, or my marriage, or my health, whatever it may be, finances, it's all just, it's all a mess, and I can't fix it. But rather than say, Master, do you not care? Can we try to say, but Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen.